All right. Hello, Steve. How's it going? Good. How's it going? Doing well. Excellent. Excellent to see you today. Um, I was hoping you could just give us a quick background on yourself and Mediafly as well. Yeah. So the, the, the short backstory is I thought I was an unemployed law entrepreneur and then I ended up here. So I I founded what's called an outsourced appointment setting business back in 2002. Uh, sorry, 2005, 2005. And um, I was in my young 20s then. Um, and uh, we had 453 what are called sales development reps over those years, over 16 years, sold that business. I also built a sales tech company called Exec Vision, which sold to Mediafly. Um, what Mediafly is, is we're a revenue enablement company. It's a consolidation where you know a lot of different uh, uh, technologies all under the same roof where you know big enterprise organizations they're kind of sick of having three four or five different tools for different things like pipeline management forecasting value selling capabilities with business value assessments business cases conversation intelligence call recording transcription and then sales content management you know, have all these things frustrating you want to consolidate it and pull it all together with one vendor that's what we're doing cool that's that sounds intense so this it was this more for a b2b type of situation or B2C or both? It's good. It's a good question. Both, uh, both. And actually my, my history, my legacy is B2B. That's what I've known my whole career. Um, and, um, and, and media fly has a lot of B2C brands and customers like Mullen and Heineken and all sorts of different companies like that. Okay, cool. And so I, I did see that you are the SVP for revenue enablement. Is that correct? Yep. So what, what are like your like, biggest responsibilities with that like how does how uh, tra tra training people internally making sure people have assets the content the resources the knowledge right place right time you know um uh it's when you're there's probably a lot of people listening who maybe grew through acquisition uh there's there's a lot to learn it's complex uh discovery takes on a different meaning when you know you're not just doing discovery for one offering but from multiple or different combinations or blends thereof so um you know, I also help a lot of companies with prospecting, training, cold calling, top of funnel, getting your foot in the door, getting meetings in the first place. Wow. So it definitely sounds like you wear quite a few hats. Um, so I like still for a while, I got the, I got some gray here. You can see it, Kathleen. So. <laughs> and actually the, fun, the funny backstory is I didn't think I was going to be in sales. Like when I first started my career, my, our family business is septic tanks. I tried to get a job as an investment banker. Coming out of college, I couldn't get a job. I had 65,000 in school loans. I literally went 0 for 22. And then I was like, what am I going to do? I started asking friends of friends and they were saying, maybe you should try sales. I was like, what is that? Selling cars? I don't, I don't even know what that means. So then I did B2B sales interviews and I went five for five in those. And I was like, well, this is God's way of saying, do this, don't do this. And at first I was terrible, but um, and I was actually about to be put on a PIP, a performance improvement plan, but through the process of, I was on, on a sales floor with a hundred people studying what works, what are the best people doing differently that I wasn't doing? That's really what it comes down to. Um, and what that is, what they're doing is going to be for me at the time, it was prospecting top of funnel. So I would run AB tests, but now in this day and age, it's things like, can I build a business case to help a customer prove the value to a CFO? Can I, can I leverage content effectively in my sales process? So do I know how to take the content that's relevant for my buyers, case studies, infographics, videos, white papers, whatever, and, and get it to them in the right point in their buying journey? I mean, this is what modern sales is all about now is this experimentation and testing, except on steroids, but we also need a little help because there's too much to test. So my yeah. backstory, my backstory is very relevant for what I'm doing today. And that, and that actually brings up a really good point because I always find it interesting because you know, obviously I'm a consumer of, of marketing emails. I still get those. Even being in marketing, I can't avoid them. Uh, I always find it interesting figuring out where they think I am in the buyer cycle based on what they're sending me. Because um, sometimes I'll get an email from a company I've never heard of and they're like, here's a coupon for your forgotten cart. I've never what, been what forgotten cart, right? <laughs> I know. Uh, you know, it's, it, I mean, look, that could be a mistake or it could be that behind the scenes, somebody did a lot of a B testing group a versus group B and what someone might have figured out. I'm hypothesizing here is that you're, when you say, Hey, you have an abandoned cart, you're much more likely to convert that person into a first paying customer versus if you don't, you're not. So then maybe they're even kind of doing a little 
trickeration here where they're claiming you have an abandoned cart when you don't. And believe it or not, a lot of people bite on that. Who knows, right? Or, or their systems are just messed up. <laughs> that's that's a possibility as well. Yeah. Cause I, so, I mean, through your you know years of experience, have you found any like top advice when it comes to the kind of content you're sending out? So, it, yeah, no, it's, it's interesting. So usually in the top of funnel, people are more interested in the topic. So they're going to be interested in industry trends. They're going to be interested in infographics perform very well. Um, they, we talk about head nodding common challenges. What's, what's the challenge specific to your business? So let me give you like, for example, I was talking to a company yesterday. This is just so random that does, um, they, they help with the intersection between privacy executives, which big companies will actually have a role called privacy, right? It's a little different than the general counsel, the head lawyer between privacy executives and product development. So if you're a big company that develops software and uh, products, you know, um, you, anything from a mobile app all the way to some sort of a customer facing SaaS tool, whatever. There, it turns out, I didn't know this, there are all sorts of like holes in the code that are essentially privacy holes. It makes the code like Swiss cheese. And, oh. the reason I, and the reason I bring this up is to say that in this case of this particular company, they were so focused on the product development part that when I read their website, I'm like, oh, so you guys are selling to like VPs of engineering or CTOs that build tech products. And they're like, no, no, we sell the privacy people because it was, it was all, it was all off. Right. It was all off. So you got to start with the persona of that person. And if I talk, talk, you know, if I go talk to that, th that persona of a privacy exec and I say to them, Hey, look, you guys, you guys have buttoned up almost everything you can button up in terms of privacy with your practices and everything. How are you guys handling the product development process? And that's going to make them go, huh? Hmm. They start nodding. Like that's a good point. Right. Like maybe I need help in that. Here are some best practice. Here are some things to think about. Don't tell them about the product yet. Don't tell them about your, your, don't give them your pitch. Instead, start with relevant content for what they do, what they care about, you know, what their peers are doing, stories and things like that at the top of the funnel. That's going to get people to start to engage a little bit and move a little bit further down the funnel. So that's like one, one example. And of course, as you're moving towards the end of the journey, um, we'll always see business cases or business value assessments, which is something we do, being having a big role. But funny enough, actually, ROI calculators, top of funnel on websites are seeing really pop, hot right now because what's happening is a lot of buyers are freezing, kind of stopping in their tracks at the very beginning. They won't even engage if they think there isn't a business case to be had. So by actually having an ROI calculator on your website, top of funnel to get people past the initial like, I don't think this could ever get approved here. I don't think I don't think my CFO would ever go for this. You go, no, there's actually a business case to be had. We can refine it later. I'll engage. Now we start talking, more people get involved in a B2B sales cycle. And then at the end, you have a real deep dive total cost of ownership analysis or business value assessment. That's another example of relevant content at different parts of the funnel. Well, that's and that's interesting you bring that up because it's oh, I mean, the older school part of me. Uh, you know, you're never supposed to put any sort of pricing on your website because you don't want to, somebody accidentally price themselves out before they even engage with you. Um, so are you saying it's kind of switching from that? So now it's it more, yeah. More well, I mean, this is this is not an opinion. This is something we're seeing in our customers. Our customers that sell expensive either technology or they a lot of them are like industrial manufacturers, but they have a technology component to what they do. They're finding by having some sort of a a buyer self-service ROI calculator on the website initially as just one of the value tools that you can, they, you can, you're going to get more top of funnel. They're actually, we're actually seeing more people converting based on that. Interesting. Yep. So it doesn't, it doesn't have to be tied so much to pricing, but it has to be able to show what the, what the, the quantitative ROI potential is going to look like. Right. And that will cause more people to convert in top of funnel. But it depends. Again, it depends. It depends on what you sell and who you sell to. Right. Because, for example, in my background, um, I used to market for a large company that sold SAP products like Business One, Business by Design, and then even the biggest one, uh, SAP uh, S4 HANA. So, you know, we were always scared of pricing, having someone just price themselves out just by seeing the, that giant price tag on the website. Because um, those big softwares are up to you know half a million dollars or excuse me half a billion dollars 
And, and it's actually interesting too, because with something like that, actually SAP is our biggest at MediaFly, our biggest partner. Um, I don't think we've tested this specifically with SAP, but there's a lot of SAP customers that we that we have, and and also it evolves and changes over time. So yeah. so your your point about you know hey look that never used to work is yeah I mean totally like absolutely there are things that weren't working that were working great three four years ago don't work now there are things and I'll give you something concrete like I'm it's very fresh and top of mind I've got my demand gen marketing team working with our SDRs that are called um, ADMs they're the people who do the prospecting hunting right. qualification. And they're trying to promote a webinar and they've been sending in mails. I said, stop it. Don't send in mails because when you, here we go again, A, B test in mails compared with regular emails with the same exact content, same message, same call to action, same everything. In mails, I mean, I've had clients and we've tested ourselves hundreds and hundreds of in mails, 400, 500, 700, 800, no meetings, zero, zilch, nada. So, but once upon a time, six, seven years ago, InMail was like the best thing ever since sliced bread. InMail was working like crazy. But what ends up happening is over time, just like everything else, all the spam goes to InMail, kind of ruins it for everyone. You can't, can't use it anymore. I mean, it doesn't work. It's yeah. pointless. So, you know, uh, another great example of that is you think social media, and this is completely unrelated to sales, but why do none of the kids use Facebook? My kids don't use Facebook because here we go all the marketing and spam and everything hit Facebook. So now the younger generations run away from that. Then they go to like Snapchat or they go to, uh, they go to TikTok. And eventually, you know, what's going to happen? Their kids are going to go, you were on TikTok. What the hell is wrong with you? Right? Like no one uses TikTok anymore because all the spam and all the crap goes there, but you're so stuck at that point. You're like, I'm using this forever. I'm just going to keep using it. But now that you know, younger people go to the new thing, this is just how the world works. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and you definitely made me feel old because I, I don't have a TikTok. <laughs> I, get, I get how it works, but it's just, I'm, I'm too old to make that trend work for me. <laughs> I, it, it was hilarious. Uh, Elizabeth Jortberg, our, our phenomenal marketer here, she does social media content marketing, other marketing. She tried to get me to do TikTok style day in the life videos and she shared a bunch with me and it's like, it's like these kind of quick cuts of like, here I am at the gym, here I am getting a cup of coffee, here I am, you know, working on my computer, here I am walking my dog, like whatever. I tried. I tried. <laughs> I, I said, Elizabeth, just it's not going to happen. You know, unless you have somebody come here and actually do this for me, I, my brain just doesn't function like this. Yeah, I once tried to do a, a, a pass the drink TikTok with my, my uh, uh, C-suite at my previous company. And it did not go swimmingly. They tried. They really tried, but it was not. It was not very smooth. <laughs> quite, quite literally, you need to be there with them in person and hold their hand through it, or just it ain't. It ain't gonna happen. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That's really what it was. Um, oh, but well, that's hilarious. Well, so then, like, so how? Because you do wear all these hats. Do you use any specific like processes or maybe technologies or whatever to? really meld between like marketing revenue sales you know from top to bottom of the funnel how do how do you get everybody into one yeah and remember i'm not usually sending content customer facing so there's like if you think about like all the content you have in your company you've got customer facing content by the way that could be like product information slicks it could be right. you know i mean there's just so much content and blogs whatever so so you've got your customer facing content I'm working with with all of our people internally to try to teach them when, how, where to use our content with the customers, and it's also recommended in you know through the CRM, through what we do, and that that's what we do here at MediaFly. So being you know kind of self serving, but the truth is I I use the hell out of it. I mean I'm in the course of onboarding, I'm constantly you know bringing uh, people relevant content in certain stages of the development that I know they can handle at that time. Um, we you know heavy heavy users of Slack when it comes to that, so that's big. Um, I'm using the heck out of call recording. The company I founded, Exec Vision, is call recording and transcription. So the idea is like game tape for your sales team. Like wh what, what's happening on your calls? I don't know. I, I have no idea. It's a black box. Not for us. Like we know because they're recorded, they're transcribed, it's in the CRM, there's a summary, generative AI summary. Um, not to be cliche, but it is generative AI summary. 
And now there's very easy to understand what's happening, trigger follow-up actions, all that kind of stuff. Very, very simple. It's right there. So I leverage the heck out of that. But again, a little bit different for me. I'm spending a little bit less of my time selling these days, except for my own services. I'm spending more of my time help teaching other people how to sell well. So what do I do? Call library. Library of the best calls. Using that all the time with new hires or existing people who are like, hey, I, I need some help on blank. I see that in Slack. I jump in, boom, check out this recording, listen to this moment. It's all annotated and ready to go so they can get exactly what they need when they need it. So those are the kinds of things that I'm, I'm, I'm using and doing day in and day out. And also super heavy na LinkedIn navigator. You know, if, if you don't have that LinkedIn navigator that's connected to your CRM, I mean, look, if you're a real small business, you don't need it, but you're missing the boat. A, a huge thing that we're seeing in, as a trend in the market is old customers going to new companies that I call OCMCs. Um, and you can really get to them quickly and easily by leveraging LinkedIn and some of the capabilities there. Like you can say, if you're a sales rep, put in what current company are we going to go after? We're going to go after my territory. So they're all their territory accounts, the accounts that they own in Salesforce are all connected to them. And who do I want to go after? People who used to work for one of my customers. So they used to work for my customer. Now they work at one of my prospects. Low hanging fruit. Right. Because they've already got the relationship going. Yeah. They already know who we are, but yeah. they, they haven't come to us. So it's just like those are the kinds of things that I'm helping people do day in and day out around here. Interesting. And also, and also with clients. I do some client work where I go and do consulting and training with clients. Okay. So then you also hand off your knowledge to your clients as well. Just yeah. kind of like interesting. So then when, when you've got all of that together and you've got everybody all trained up, what are the, the what are the most important KPIs that you're looking for? Um, conversion rate. And are they monthly, quarterly, yearly? How does that look? Yeah. Conversion rate, win rate. Number, so op, number of opportunities rate created, lead conversion rate. Win rate is opportunity created through close, looking at deal velocity, looking at average deal size, number of products sold per account or per opportunity. We're also looking at future like quote attach rate, which is like um, if we're cross selling other products to existing customers or growing the existing customer. Those are all things that we're going to look at and tie that back to enablement to say, hey, did we do a good job in enablement? If you do, those metrics are going to be better. Right. Also ramp time. So time to first deal, time to to quote attainment. Interesting. And those are all going to be very similar. I mean, there's most enablement people. I mean, I, I don't think anybody listening who's an enablement is going to go, wow, that was insightful. I mean, no, it's just that's par for the course. That's just the, the, those are the ones. Well, right. I, I think it's interesting because like what you're saying is like the, like the, um, the add-ons. Now, how would you feel about like one of your salespeople having 20 small sales in a month or somebody having too large sales like would you adjust there well, I, I can answer that very easily because our reality is we only sell the companies with three thousand or more employees at this point it's mandated <laughs> by, our, by our CEOs. so if you know if you're running around out there with 700 employees like you can't even buy something from us if you want to um because because really what we're doing is is a you know a suite of a lot of different technologies pulled together it's really the biggest companies get the most value right. but i get the, the in the spirit of the question in the spirit of the question, uh, we would we here would rather have one big than three small or four small. Historically, I would have answered that differently with my old business and where we were, that we would have probably wanted to have three small to start because it's going to get you more repetitions under the belt. This is a different animal. The kind of salespeople we're hiring are, is a different animal. They don't need, they're not recent college grads or anything. Like they're, right. they're the kinds of people who... They know how to sell already. That's not what, you know, we need to teach them how to sell this pretty quickly. And oh, by the way, you know, deal size is going to be 100K, 250K kind of thing. Right, right. Yeah. So they're, they're already coming in prepared. Oh, yeah. Right. And on how to sell, right? But not how to sell us. Right, right. Yeah. Now, so then how do you, how do you like foster that culture of innovation then? Because they already know how to sell, you know, what, I guess, what is your sales pitch? to your new salespeople um, and then keeping them. The, the, yeah, they, they, I mean, they, the thing is, is that the people who come in here, they just generally, they love learning. They love, you know, hearing things from each other. They There's not a lot of ego. It's one of our core values, you know, do the right thing with no ego. 
And I, what, I, what I've been finding with the people were, and I'm not involved in hiring. So whoever's doing the hiring is doing a good job. <laughs> but, but what I'm, what I'm finding is that, you know, everyone's helping each other out. They want to mostly do, you know, do the right thing. And, um, you know, it's been, it's been nice. It's been a delight working with people that want to absorb stuff. That is cool. Um, and, and by the way, it's worth noting, I have worked with a lot of people in my career that don't want to learn. I've worked with a lot of people in my career that don't want to absorb stuff. You know, I'm not going to name names and mostly not at my companies, but rather my clients that I've worked with, like there, it'll be very common. You have people kind of like, humph, I know everything there is to know about sales. And it's like, look, no, you don't. I mean, um, my friend Art Sobchak says sales is the school you never graduate from. I think that is a perfect, beautiful quote. It's exactly right. Sales is the school you never graduate from. And I learned something new about buying and selling all the time. It's one of the things I put on my LinkedIn profile and I'm a real believer in that. So if, if you think you know everything about B2B sales, I can't wait to watch you get smacked down in the next two to three years because you're going to get smacked down. If you're not getting smacked down hard already, you will be. You yeah. will be humble. And there's also a lot of salespeople that truth be told, they're not very good. And the only reason that they've been quota crushers is because they've been at the right place at the right time and they've got a hot product and a hot product market fit where honestly I could put anybody not anybody, but you know, anybody who's reasonably competent, someone who didn't ever attain quota in another company, you put them in there, slot them in, boom, all of a sudden they hit quota again and again and again, because really they're catching demand. They're catching demand, but we're living in November, 2023, moving into 2024. This is a new world. It's much more difficult to sell. The bar is much higher for how you prove value and how you, how you get multiple stakeholders involved in an opportunity and create consensus. It's much more difficult now than it was five years ago. Yeah. I would say we do have a much higher, I don't want to say educated, but more questioning uh, uh, prospect base now. It's not, you know, I don't know if you've ever seen Wolf of Wall Street, but it's not selling penny stocks to people who have no idea what stocks are anymore. Um, Very true. And, and to get, of, course I, of course I've watched it. I also lost a sale training deal one time to uh, Jordan Belfort. Are you serious? Yeah, yeah, that was I was doing. It was actually right when the movie came out, and um, I was talking to someone, and we, you know, I was, had it all set up. I did my discovery, you know, a quantitative definition of success, you know, aligned the proposal exactly what they were looking for. They said, "This looks great. We think we're going to move forward with you." We're still talking to somebody else. Oh, I, I understand that. Who are you talking to? Jordan Belfort. <laughs> and I said, "I just saw the movie. Excuse me. You mean the Wolf of Wall Street?" They're like, "Yeah, the Wolf of Wall Street." I go, you do know he's a convicted felon, right? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, we know that. I go, well, hey, look, if you want to go with a convicted felon, more power to you. He's definitely a name. I they mean, went with, they went with the felon. <laughs> you're going to lose out to somebody. I would love to lose out to Jordan Belfort. I think that would Why be. Why not? Why not? Sure. But um, to get to what you're saying about people not wanting to learn, I've had. A previous leader so I, obviously i work in marketing i had a previous leader who went to a seminar in person in like 2007 mm -hmm. for google ads and this was in like 2015 so we're you know almost 10 years later and i'm trying to explain to this leader like this is not how this works anymore he's like no i went to a seminar this is it and just refused yeah. to refuse and to i'll tell you what kathleen that's another thing that's very frustrating to me is like it's not across the board. The, there are too many experts out there that will say things like, and I'll go, I'm gonna rewind the clock a long time. Cold calling is dead. So now that 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 mantra was was on repeat from HubSpot, it kind of HubSpot's inbound marketing kind of created the whole cold calling is dead myth. Um, now at the time, to be fair, when I had my outsourced outsourcing business, outsourced prospecting business, we, we we would have 35 reps at any given time, basically banging the phone and email and LinkedIn trying to get appointments for our clients. So we measured how they would get their meetings. And we saw for a while, it kind of it was usually around 60%. It started to dip. It kind of dipped down at like a little bit below 50% for a while when that was really like, a, you know, everyone was banging the drum on that. What do we find out? Like, what do we see later on? Over a few more years, it popped right back up. I just talked to an outsourcing company recently that's got hundreds of people on the phone, two, 300 on the phone. And I said, how are you guys getting your meetings these days? What, what are they, where are they coming from? Cause they measure it. He said the phone 70%. Most of my clients that I'm working with doing prospecting training, the sales prospecting Academy, same question. How are you getting most, most of your meetings phone? 
for most people now, it's actually phones one, uh, LinkedIn's two, not in mail though, in mail's dead, yeah. um, but connect first and then send a direct message. Uh, but you have to wait a few days. And then number three is email. So it's, it's one of these things where it, it, it makes me angry when these experts run around and they say, oh, we know this, this, this works across the board, but it depends. Like, for example, if you're, if you're selling to social media marketers, what we learned very quickly, because we used to have those campaigns is they actually don't answer the phone. So the phone's kind of dead for them. So that's true. So how do you get them? Social media. We would like tweet them. We would like Instagram them or whatever, you know, like communicate with them that way. Cause that's how they communicate. I have a client that sells to video game studios, video game studios. They hang out on like these very specific video game, like platforms that exist like Twitch, but they don't go on Twitch. The gamers are on Twitch, but they go to stuff that's like that for people who make video games. So if you want to go communicate with them, that's how you do it. In a lot of Europe these days, WhatsApp, some countries in Europe, WhatsApp is absolutely the best channel for prospecting in other countries. Culturally, it's completely frowned upon to even bring up anything business related on WhatsApp. It depends country to country. So my whole point is it depends. And instead of someone coming back from a conference, like I went to a conference and they said blank, that's not a blanket unilaterally across every business to know what's going to work for your business. You need to test, right? run those AB tests. Otherwise you don't know. Yeah. Uh, AB tests are definitely one of my favorite features or, or testing requirements that I I've done before. Is that you do actually get a lot of information, especially like industry to industry. And like you said, even country to country, um, things are different for wherever they are in their life and in their fun in the funnel. Um, so I did like what you say, you know, we're in November, 2023, obviously we've gone through things that shall not be named in the last couple of years. Uh, where do you see 2024 going? Like in the terms of like revenue generation and like, prepping for the changes that are happening? Uh, you, got, you got to bring up AI. I do not see AI displacing salespeople the way that's being predicted. Not, not yet, it's, unless it's transactional. If it's very transactional, AI will disrupt those jobs. Um, I do see AI playing a huge role in helping people with anything from, you know, right content, right content for the buyer at the right time, helping them understand uh, what's going on within their sales pipelines, what the next best action is for deals, um, helping them, you know, craft follow-up messages and emails, those kinds of things, top of funnel prospecting um, that's personalized, like um, to give a plug for a company called Reggie.ai, R-E-G-I-E.ai is an example where they're doing super interesting things there with personalized emails based that, that where the gen, gen AI is writing it. But what they do that's interesting is if if the, the email comes out wrong, because it does a lot, right? It's, it's still generative AI. Right. You can hit a button and it will like do another one until you're like, that's it. Or you can replace components of it very easily with like a click. So I see, I see the I see a world where um, you know, fewer salespeople are selling more deals. Um, I, I I wish I could a lot of people have said the whole 80-20 thing is gone because of all the reduction of force and the layoffs. Um where you're going to see like much more consistent quote attainment across the board. I'm actually seeing that's not the case because now that selling is harder. And now that a lot of like the, let's be honest, the weak gazelles got called during riffs. Sometimes it wasn't, but sometimes it was. Then you're left with in theory, better, stronger, faster salespeople that are better doing the job. If you're, if they're armed and enabled with the right tools, the right capabilities, they can sell a lot more. The productivity can be higher, but the reality that I'm seeing right now is that a lot of people are not in a, place where they can really adopt this stuff, change, evolve. They just aren't. And so I think we're going to be in a world where we start to see that 80, 20, maybe even getting worse, which is exactly the opposite of what people are predicting right now. So I, I see that like, look, if you're in, if you're in sales and you know how to leverage all this stuff, all these different technologies and capabilities, whew, like you could potentially do really, really well. Um, but if you don't, it's going to be tougher and tougher. I'm not saying you're a dinosaur, but it's going to be tougher and tougher. Right. And that's, and that's actually a good point. I always forget about AI, but I do use it in my day to day regularly. Um, uh, how do you, you use it right now? Well, what, one's prospecting um, top of funnel. So go ask like, what does this company do? What are their products and services? 
I did a tip of the day on this. I do a, uh, a tip of the day on LinkedIn. Um, and they're all free. If you, if you go on LinkedIn, connect with me, you'll get them. And, and then after that, you ask like, which industries do they sell to? Who are their competitors for those different products? Uh, it's gold. I mean, it's, you know, and then take that based on this, write me a prospecting email. What it does initially is amp, but you, but now you don't have the blank page syndrome. Now you can, right. um, another way we're using it is for message development by persona. Right. There's a lot, there are lots. Uh, internally, we use uh, something called Iris that our engineering team developed to ask it questions about anything from product or integration documentation stuff if you're an engineer. Um, what's going on with sales pipeline or forecasting, similar customers, like all the questions you would potentially want to ask in a, in a revenue go to market team. It just it spits out the answers. It's pretty neat. It doesn't get it all right. I'm right. not saying it's perfect, but it's pretty good. Pretty good. And it's almost instant. Yeah. Yeah. Um, interesting. That I didn't. I so you you plugged uh, what was it? Reggie AI. Reggie AI. Yeah. AI. And so, do they write out email? I think I missed. Yeah, it literally writes the email personalized. Oh, and so just already crafted writing. And personalized based on something about the prospect. I call it three by three research, finding three points on the company or contact in three minutes. So, Kathleen, if I googled your name, Kathleen Haney, with your company name then no doubt this podcast would come up right. and, and, and what, you know, manually, the way you'd have to do is look, see the podcast come up manually, write the email. You know, I, I heard your podcast with Steve Richard, this caught my attention, whatever. This is just doing that automatically. That's cool. That is yeah. really cool. Yeah. All right. I guess AI 2024, here we come. <laughs> yeah. But again, I, I, not the way that everyone else is talking about it, right? Like I can't emphasize this enough. So I, I've heard people predict, you know, sales experts like me who are like generative AI is going to make the SDR job uh, obsolete. Now, it actually has done that for some like content creation jobs. So it actually is making some jobs obsolete. Everyone in my network is hiring SDR, sales development reps that prospect. Yeah. So I, I, if it's making jobs obsolete, it's not translating into reality right now. Otherwise, I would have hundreds of SDRs being like, my job got eliminated, coming to me with their resumes, help me find a job, Steve. I know you're connected. I got none of that. To the contrary, I've got people hiring SDRs come and look at me and be like, hey, you know, help me find good SDRs. Or I'm not a recruiter, but just, do you know anybody? Right. Yeah, and I, you know, I, as in marketing, I, I, I've had a lot of people say they're concerned that, you know, marketing is gonna be obsolete because generative AI is gonna go out there and do all of that for us. and Unfortunately, um, they don't have that quite that creative touch. They don't have the human touch yet. And so I don't see, I see it being an excellent tool coming in the future, but I don't see it destroying jobs like everyone is predicting, at least not in the foreseeable future. I mean, yeah, it, look, if you're, if you're a content factory and you just crank out kind of generic content at high quantities, you're up, you're done. It's wow. over the, the, you know, it's, it's, it's day, day zero of the, of the comet hitting for the, you know, in the, in the, not Jurassic, Triassic, one of those periods. Yeah. You know, and then boom, dinosaurs are gone. It's over. But like, for most of us, that's not what we're doing day in and day out. Yeah. And I mean, yeah, because we're industry specific. AI can write, write a great generic blog, but they cannot write, you know, a specific blog for this specific brand in this specific country with links and everything. Um, so, yeah. I, I totally am on page with you. Although, ask me again in ten to twenty years, maybe it'll be a little bit different. Oh, learn, it's it, hedge. Learn, learn AI prompts. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I just mean, hopefully, in ten to twenty years, it hasn't gotten too smart. <laughs> That's true. We don't need a term. We don't need a Terminator scenario. I was just gonna say, I, I don't know if we have uh, the Terminator capabilities yet, or if they travel back in time. Um, but yeah, excellent. So I guess I really would like to wrap up uh, with you know any key advice that you'd like to give out that any, I know you say you do tip of the day, but what's, what's like your favorite piece of advice? Um, so I would say for, for sales leaders right now, my, my biggest piece of advice is you need to go out there, get in the trenches and close a couple of deals yourself so that you can really understand what the state of the world looks like in the state of selling today 
and it's not what it did when you were carrying a bag. It's not. It's different. The the, the skills, the, the the required you know knowledge and stuff, and a lot of that's the same. Some of it's changed that we've talked about. There's no substitution for closing a couple of deals yourself. And then when you go back and and, and then when you go back and look at your sales team and work with them again and, and, and get them organized so as many of them can be quote as possible, you're gonna do it with a with new lens. You're gonna be looking through a new lens. Right. I like that. Well, it's very been very nice talking to you, Steve. Wonderful bits of information, definitely lots of nuggets. I'm definitely gonna keep the uh, uh, sales is the is the school you never graduate from. Did I get that one yeah. right? Yeah, sales is a school you never graduate from. That's right. I love that. I think I think that's very relevant, especially nowadays. Uh, but thank you so much for your time. I've really enjoyed speaking with you, and uh, I look forward to collaborating later. Awesome. Thanks, Kathleen. Thanks. Take Thanks. care.